All right, so um, sorry about my voice. It was fine until after the prayer meeting this morning. But um, uh, yeah, so Pastor Jack's going to be gone. I'm going to be teaching that class. And so what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about the personality profile, your personality profile, and how you relate to other people. And so um, that's going to be important. Are we talking about the personality profile of Jesus in that class or just them? Do you know? You don't want to answer. We can talk about it in private. But anyway, it's, it's going to be a very interesting class. Now, we do have the seminar coming up where we're, for those of you that pray, I want to be like Christ. I want more of Jesus in me. So what we've done is we've gone through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we've looked at the times when Jesus was dominant, driver, determined, uh, uh, like that. And then we've looked at the times when Jesus was inspiring, fun-loving, delightful, pleasant. And we've looked at the other times when Jesus was stable and steady and consistent and supportive. And we've looked at the times when Jesus was precise. So we've looked at the times when Jesus was somewhat like Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. They both have the same personality. Okay, we've looked at the times when Jesus was inspirational like uh, a public speaker, a, a Zig Ziglar or, or a uh, Joel Osteen. We've looked at the times when Jesus was just steady, supportive, consistent, and delightful like Gail Haggard. And we've looked at the times when Jesus was precise and cautious and careful like your accountant or your surgeon. Okay? I would encourage you never to hire a surgeon that is inspirational, exciting, and easily distracted. <clears throat> that might be confusing. All right? With the fact that you get the wrong appendage removed. All right? So... So we looked at all that, and what we'll do in our Jesus uh, seminar is we will read the scriptures that are associated with those different things and say, we, there are times in our lives when we need to be the dominant, determined person. And there are other times in our life when we just should be having fun and enjoying life and enjoying one another and just um, uh, laid back. By the way, speaking about that, we have... A Jesus ministered for three and a half years. That's roughly a thousand days. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us a record of 50 days. All right, so what was he doing during that other time? He was ATVing in the mountains. <laughs> That's what he was doing. He was camping out with his friends. He was just, he was fishing. He was... Uh, enjoying scenery. He was going on walks with his friends. He was chilled. He was he lay back. He wasn't always driving demons out, but when he needed to be able to do that, he did that. See, that's the way we need to be. When we talk about we want to be like Jesus, there are specifics about that. But my guess is, since most of us are spirit-filled, we just think if we pray and if we fast and things like that, we'll just naturally become like Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit helps. The Word of God helps. There's no doubt about that. But it would be interesting to look at some of the specifics to see why is it that Jesus would be so compassionate that the anointing would flow out of him and heal people one time. And then a different time, he's turning over the tables in the money of the money changers. And he's telling the religious leaders of his day that they're snakes and vipers. And that they're like graves that are whitewashed on the outside and inside are full of dead men's bones. See, he was able to deal with people based on the way the people were that he needed to influence. And so he had people that he just enjoyed being on vacation with. And he had other people that he, um, that he needed to poke them a little bit. Scratch, in the South they call it scratching them. Where you just scratch, actually in the South, they don't think you're a good pastor unless you scratch them. So, so the greatest compliment a pastor can receive in some places in the South is, they say, how was the sermon today? Oh, he scratched me good. 
Okay? So there were sometimes Jesus really did a great job with that. Other times he was just, he was persuading people. And there were other times where he very precisely described things in the exact, correct, precision, careful way that it was supposed to be. So we're going to study that and we're going to look at that and we will touch on some of that on Tuesday night. So if you're interested in that, you'd be welcome to join us. Okay, now, I wrote a blog. Gail and I wrote a blog this last week called, Is Equality a Meth? Okay, here's what's stirring this up in me. What's stirring this up in me is that there is great popularity for the first time in American history for socialist and some communist ideology. And so um, we've always dealt with some of that back years ago. We had to deal with quite an infusion of communist ideology in the State Department that was dealt with. It's come and gone through the years in America because we're a free society and people debate how much influence the government should have or how little influence the government should have, how much freedom and liber liberty people should have, and how much, um, how much government uh, control people should have. So I start off with the, one of the quotes from it. On the front, I say, free market democracies require that we provide either goods or services desired by someone else in order to make a living. Here's what I'm saying here. If you're not a servant, if you don't identify a need that other people have and provide that need with your service, you won't be able to earn a living. So a free market system forces people to be servants or they will be poor. All right, now that's something most people don't get because they think, well, the government knows how many shoes we get, so the government ought to just assign people how many people are gonna be working in the shoe factory and do that, it never works. Because if it's a government assigned job, there are always either uh, 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 surpluses or shortages because they don't respond to market signals. All right, so a market signal telling any businessman or businesswoman how many Cheerio boxes to have in King Supers. See, market signals make it so they have enough Cheerio boxes there for you to buy your Cheerios, but not so many that they're stacked in the parking lot. How do they do that? The central planners cannot figure that out. Because it's just what happened in China just recently. They were totally unprepared, so they were able to build a hospital in 10 days. Okay, they actually built three of them. How, have any of you seen those hospitals? They're essentially parking garages with walls on the outside and a few toilets at the end. They're worse than the old World War II barracks. But that's the way that works. Have you been to some of our new hospitals on the north end of town? Okay, what's driving that? What's driving it is the baby boomers are getting older. There's a greater demand for high quality uh, medical services. And I guarantee you, when you walk into our hospitals in Colorado Springs, you will not feel like you're in a parking garage. Okay, and so, so now I understand the medical thing is a little odd. That's why this is so, this was hard to write because these are complicated issues that have been debated in, in virtually every country of the world for the last 100 years. Ever since Marx developed his idea of nationalizing production and controlling production and consumption, we've dealt with people who say, you know what, if I could have all that power, I could make it good for the workers who need to unite and prosper more. In the vast majority of those cases, they became dictators, the common people got poorer, and the dictators got more wealthy. And so wage the wage dispersion did not decrease even though that's what was promised. What happened was it got worse. The leaders of government became tyrants and the average people, if they, didn't co if they cooperated, they got poorer. If they didn't cooperate, they were killed. More people have died of genocide under the banner of communism and socialism than any other banner in the last hundred years. 
The exception would be Nazism, which was still, which was a, which was a, a different anomaly. They had a free market system with the Nazis, but of course they were uh, tyrants. And so, so we've, we don't even know how many Stalin killed. They say somewhere between 15 and 25 million people in his own gulags. They just estimate. We have no idea about the, about the virus that's in the world right now because the people that originally reported it were accused and convicted of starting rumors, which is a crime, in communist China. And they, they were, they were uh, convicted at first, and then some of them, a couple of them, have died now because they weren't cared for when they got the virus they were trying to warn people about. Okay, everybody, this is important now. I made a little, uh, a little I, I did a little something on this a few weeks ago. And I had a well-meaning pastor write me and say, Pastor Ted, you are one of the greatest teachers of the Bible. You need to stick to the Bible. Okay, here's what I responded to him. I said, teaching the Bible and healthy spirituality is my number one calling in life. And within that calling is life is a responsibility to help the most people possible be as well off as possible. In order for people to be as well off as possible, they have to understand the economic and political systems that open the door for people to be as well off as possible. And they have to understand spirituality. I don't know of any communist government that has freedom of worship. They shut it down. When we were smuggling Bibles back when I was a boy, the number one thing the Soviet guards and the Islamic guards would look for if you were trying to get into an Islamic, they called them republics, they aren't, they're theocracies, or, a, or the old Soviet Union, the number one thing they looked for was a Bible. They looked for Bibles before they looked for drugs, before they looked for guns, before they looked for political pamphlets, they looked for, they looked for Bibles before they looked for anything else. Now, why would that be? It's because when people get filled with the Holy Spirit, they become devoted to people being better off. And when you're devoted to people being better off, you're concerned about civil liberties, you're concerned about rule of law, you're concerned about limitation of political power of people that may be living for power. You get concerned about those things and the communists can't control those people. They can't control people that are full of the Holy Spirit. They can't control people that have Bibles because we start living for eternity and for others. We're not selfish. All right, so I wrote this pastor back and I said, I can't in good conscience with the rise of socialism the way it is in the United States, I cannot not say something about it. And so I'm going to say it because I am committed to the prosperity of the people within my sphere of influence. And I am committed to their children understanding how free markets work, how goods and services are around, how they got the blue jeans that they want, how they got the iPhones that they want, how they got the cars that they want. Our young men and women need to understand how we got what we have and why other countries have more natural resources than we do and the people are still poverty stricken. There has to be a reason for that. Why is it that you can have lush greenery all around and people starving to death? There is no shortage of food in the world, but there is a government problem in the world. So if people are starving to death, it's not because we can't produce enough corn and wheat in Iowa. It's because we have a distribution problem because they want a central command system to determine where the wheat and where the corn goes. Okay, so everybody, do you think I've got some convictions about this? You bet I do. All right, so you need to know that this thing about equality, I can tell you how equal you are. You are equal in the fact that you have 24 hours in your day just like everybody else. You are equal in the fact that you will die. And if you don't die, there's only one exception. You're going, to, you're going to be alive when Jesus returns and you'll meet him in the air. But your current state will end. It's equal. Whether you're very wealthy or very poor, you're going to step out of your body and, and into eternity.
And then you have equality to seek the Lord. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, in the approach to the Lord. You're totally free to approach the Lord. That's where equality stops. There's no more equality past it. Now, we as Americans are working for equality under the law. But any of you that follow the news at all, you know that's still an ideal. It's not a reality yet. Okay, then, from then on, every one of you will live a different life than everybody else. You will even be different than your own brothers and sisters. And you may say, but we were raised in the same family. No, you weren't. You had different brothers and sisters than they did. That's supposed to be a joke. It's a revelation. Because, see, if you're a girl, you were their sister, not, oh, well. All right, so, so nobody lives the life you live. Nobody makes the choices you make. Nobody responds exactly the way you respond. You are ne- unique. You're a male or you're a female because God's plan for you was for you to be able to use that for the advancement of his glory. You're black, white, Hispanic, uh, whatever, because God will give you an opportunity to use whatever race or gender or ethnicity you have for the advancement of God's glory. You don't need to despise it. If you're black, be fully black and use your blackness to advance the kingdom. If you're white, use your whiteness to advance the kingdom. Be humble about it. Don't be prejudiced. Don't discriminate against people. Don't be hateful. If you're a woman, use those instincts and things that women have. If you're a man, use those instincts and things that men have. Okay? You don't need to be ashamed of how God created you. As long as you're not a bigot, a controller, a manipulator. As long as you don't engender hate, which you can't do if you're spirit-filled. What you've got to do is use yourself as a servant for all. Humble yourself and be confident in who you are as a man, a woman, black, white, uh, you, whatever, however God made you genetically. You use that. Never despise it. And if God gives you strength, use that strength to serve others. Don't use that strength to hurt others. So if you use that strength to serve others, if you're privileged, let's say you come from a wealthy family and you're privileged. Let's say you're white from a wealthy family. You're white and privileged. Use that to make other people's lives better. See, if you're, if you're um, a great athlete, use that to make other people's lives better. If you're a great thinker and you're a scholar, use that to make other people's lives better. See, whatever benefit God has given you, you use that for others and it'll it'll bless them and God will bless you. But if you use your privilege, your power to lord over others or to hurt others or things like that, then that becomes a difficulty. And that's one of the things people are concerned about. As soon as Jesus came, we realized he used his power and authority to make the lives of others better. He had all power and authority in the universe. He humbled himself and became a man. He became a servant to all. There was no, but he took on the sins of all. And when he took on the sins of everyone, he made himself lower than every other person on the earth so he could wash our feet. He was the idea then that led to us having public servants, us using government power, us using monetary power to serve others. That's where the idea of servant leadership came from. It's in Philippians 2. It's an, it's an analysis of the life of Christ. That's the way we are. All right, so that's what this blog is about. If that offends you, please don't let that offense separate us. All right, instead, let's stay together as brothers or sisters. But you have to understand I'm an old Bible smuggler from years ago when the Iron Curtain was the Iron Curtain. I know what excessive government control will do to the average 
person in any nation. Whether they use the excuse of a, a, a philosophy that would be um, extreme socialism or communism. And by the way, I'm not against government involvement where it's needed and important. I, there, there's, there's need for government. We have to have government. We have to have strong government. We have to have a strong military. We need a police force where they carry guns. We need, well, I'm, I'm for government, but I'm not for government overstepping and, and hampering people from being able to be creative and innovative in their development of service for others. Think if we would have told Steve, jo Steve Jobs he needed to work in a laundromat instead of inventing Apple products. Think if we would have told um, the Microsoft, uh, Microsoft, who is it? Bill Gates. Think if we would have told Bill Gates that he should stay in college and not do what he wants to do, go over and invent the computer. Okay? If we would have told those guys that, we wouldn't have had near the advancements that we have now. Because of those advancements, what we're going to be able to do in exploration, in research, in development, and things like that, and those things are making people's lives better. Now, they aren't moral. People can use those tools for bad things or good things. That's our role in the church. Okay, so you need a church, you need families, you need government, and you need freedom and liberty. And you put that together with prices and production determined by supply and demand, then, so the prices give you good value, so, so things work, there's enough apples in your grocery store, you can go up to the grocery store, I guarantee you, there are going to be good apples there that are not rotting. There's going to be Captain Crunch and Cheerios. There's going to be Twinkies. There's going to be wonderful, wonderful fruits and vegetables for those of you so inclined. And there's going to be macaroni and cheese for those of you so inclined. And we will know which you're inclined to next week. Okay, so, so every one of us have those choices. You, we have our choices, how to respond to things. You're unique. So don't you let people tell you that we're just a group of people and everybody should be treated equally. I have five children that Gail and I have raised. They're all grown now. We did not raise them the same. It's because three of our children are dominant, driving, controlling, powerful guys. It, I mean, these guys. Okay, so, so for us to raise them, I mean, just to get their attention required excessive, excessive attempts at influence. Now they're all grown. They're very successful. They're servants. They love the Lord. They love the church. They're wonderful. Okay? Another child of ours is stable, steady, supportive, kind, Thoughtful. I'm talking Alex. He's the most wonderful man. If I would have treated Alex the way I treated the three dominant guys, he would have been wounded forever. And I didn't treat the three dominant guys bad. All I wanted was them to recognize the fact that they had a mother and father. <laughs> okay? But with, with, the, with the supportive one, he watched everything and he always made peace. He, and he continues to do that. He reads my blogs. Can you believe that? He sends me comments about my blogs. He watches the services on the internet. He's just supportive. He's wonderful. He lives in Seattle. He's the chief operating officer of a big company up there. And he tells me he's the only born-again, spirit-filled conservative that he knows of in the entire city. <laughs> huh? Maybe the state. Maybe the state. <laughs> Jeff says, okay, so for survival reasons, he doesn't talk like I'm talking right now. <laughs> if I was at, pastoring a church there and said this, I would probably be uh, doing something else Monday. <laughs> and so, so but, but, but this, is, this is important. It all ties together. Christ has given us freedom. When people get spirit filled, they get creative. Have you noticed? So even churches, if they over-control spirit-filled people, they thwart creativity and ministry. 
If you're, you're pastoring spirit-filled people, get them spirit-filled, committed to the words, then let them go. And they do wonderful things for people. That couple right there, they're saving up their pennies, nickels, and dimes because they want to go to the Philippines because she's Filipino. They have a wonderful ministry there. They're part of a big Filipino ministry, and they're putting their money together to get to the Philippines to take time off. Both of them are gainfully employed, and they want to go out there. They, they want to go to the Philippines and serve other people. And let me tell you something about them. They can't help themselves because they're spirit-filled. Okay, that's why all of us need to prosper. Because it's expensive to be a good Christian. Because you want to help so many people. Have you noticed that? We get two char jars of peanut butter, we want to give one of them to somebody. And see, every one of us should be like that because that's the way being spirit-filled is. Okay, so that's the blog for this week. And I would highly suggest that this be a conversation starter with your friends. Now, I know, I know. You say you didn't want to have to cook Christmas meal for too many of your family members, so you brought up religion and politics at Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> it was a joke, she wrote. Okay, so, so that is true in this environment. But in this environment where people have lost the ability for, for reasonable discourse about big ideas, we can't let that happen to our families. And we can't have, let that happen to the friends that pass our Who Cares test. You may have friends that you don't care about. Let them believe what they want. Okay? But you do need to know we live in a democracy. And let me tell you how this thing works. You all know Jonathan. He's got the mind of, what would you say? <laughs> okay, probably a nine or ten year old. Okay, then we have Marcus, who does uh, corporate law. He works for huge corporations, and his personality is a driver who's friendly and cautious. So what he writes for these companies, he never goes to court. What he writes for these companies is precisely right. He's pleasant while he does it, and he is a driver. Okay, so he graduated from both Harvard and Georgetown, all right, to be able to do what he does. All right, then we have Jonathan. They both have the same vote. Do you know in America, special needs people can vote? Okay, Jonathan, I, and Marcus was writing me, correcting me on my, my uh, everything about, I believe, about... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right, would have cost me thousands of dollars to get that legal opinion. But anyway, uh, he was letting me know what I should think. And I wrote him back and I said, he, he was disturbed about what was going on in Washington, as I'm sure many of you have been. Okay, and I wrote him back and I said, Marcus, somehow this system works. I understand you as a young man that's well-educated and very thoughtful are very concerned. But you have to understand in our system, we believe in one person, one vote. And what that means is you're going to cast a vote for the primary and for the election. It has the exact same value as Jonathan's vote. So humble yourself. And you pray for our country. Because other people won't think exactly like you, and you need to respect them. He didn't respond. <laughs> okay. I know you other parents can't imagine that happening. All right. But it's important for us to understand that, that we respect people. And these ideas are in, undergirded in us because we're Christians. So you want to know what a, being a Christian means? It means that we do the things that make the most people better off. So we get them saved. We get them spirit filled. We help them be productive. We help them care. All that type of thing. All right. So with that in mind, you ready to go to the scripture? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Okay. A couple items. What are you hearing me say? Just a couple of you. What am I saying so far today? Huh? 
Yeah, every vote matters. That's what you got. Okay, good. Well, and you're a woman, so you earned it. We men got it for free, according to some. Okay? All right? And see that type of thing. That should all be eliminated with the gospel. No male or female. But there, some men are men. I mean, men are men. Women are men. <laughs> Sorry. Men are men. Women are women. Blacks are blacks. Whites are whites. Um, these things are true. But they don't cause us to judge one another. They don't ever cause us to hurt one another. They can never be used as a point of discrimination or woundedness or even judgment. We, we, that, that's not the scale. This diversity amongst us is for the purpose of effectiveness for the kingdom of God. God created us this way. So we need to embrace it and use it for the gospel. See, listen, Jonathan uses his thing for the gospel. Marcus's thing is totally different. Christy's thing is totally different. All of them are different, and they all have their own types of ministries that fits with their personality, their style, their ethnicity, their gender. All those things are to be used, never despised. Does that make sense? And where it gets a bad rap is when people don't recognize that they're created by God, and they think that whatever they are is superior. And that's the time for all of us to just to be grateful for any blessings we have, humble about those blessings, realizing that's a gift from God, and then being responsible to do the best we can to serve his kingdom. Amen? That was a weak amen. Okay. All right, but I understand. I understand. Okay, anybody want to say anything else in addition to... Yes. Um, when you were talking about markets and market indicators yeah. um, and, you know, how many Cheerios need to be purchased and not yeah. purchased. But the other thing that kind of informs that, I think, is everybody going along with what you were saying, working in their strengths yeah. and not being forced to work in their weaknesses. Because if you had me designing Cheerios. Right. You would not never so buy a Cheerio. Exactly so good, right. Yeah. But you have the right You'd people. You'd probably make them way too healthy. Oh, they'd be terrible. They would be terrible. Yeah. They would, you know, if you had me, you know, putting together a flu vaccine, also terrible. Yeah, that we would all work. die. So it's really yeah. important that to realize that when right. the government is forcing people to do something because there's a shortage or yeah. taking people out because there's too many, that's also bad. Yeah. You know, you need to be doing what you, you know, operating in your strength. And here's how weakness. to measure it. But get this. See, because the biggest lie in America, I think, in the springtime is all these commitment services where somebody stands up and tells a bunch of college students, just do whatever your heart wants you to do. I would never tell a group of college boys to do what they want to do. That's insanity. Instead, you tell them, do the right thing and do something, produce a good or a service that will meet other people's needs. So you measure the marketability of something. So you do something if somebody else says there's a value. So I could think there's value in wagon wheels. And be a hard worker, produce wagon wheels all day. I'd starve to death. But if, if other people think there's a value in car tires, and I start producing car tires, I may have a market. You see, and so you're exactly right. You find that area where other people need something and you use your strengths to meet that need. That's what prosperity is. But see, I love our system because if you're not a servant or if you're not motivated by the rewards of being a servant, then you're going to starve to death. And so, so I like that system. Now, I believe there ought to be safety nets for certain people. I think there need to be things like that, but not so much of a safety net that it destroys incentive in people that can be creative. There is nothing greater that God has given us than the creative mind within to work and develop things to, to make other people's lives better. Toilets that flush. Roads that can be cleaned without busting up. Electricity that continually flows. Computer systems that work, I say to the computer man. And the hostess of a wonderful lodge in the mountains that just loves hosting other people. And so, so they, when we find these things and there's a demand for it, it can be a real blessing. Okay, one more comment. Oh, are you finished, Ashley? Well, for, force versus freedom. 
That's a huge yeah, that's idea. A good way to put Economically, it. Yeah. spiritually, I mean, just across right. the board. And big government brings a lot of force. In the blog, I say things like, listen, nobody's forced to go to church in America, but here's what it'll produce for you. So there's a lot of incentive to figure out what the, what the family of God is and fully take advantage of it. You'll be healthier. You'll be more secure. You'll be stronger. You'll be uh, better relationally. You'll have all kinds of benefits to come to a church, even if you're not a believer. But if you add to that being a believer, oh, the benefits go off the charts. And every bit of research says that. So you're in the right place this morning, but nobody forced you at gunpoint to be here this morning. Aren't you glad I didn't come to your house? Okay, yeah. To keep this somewhat simple, I can't help but think of the very thing that's sitting in my lap and my responsibility. He's holding his son, by the way. Yeah. For those of you over Radio, here. not television, I guess. <laughs> the, the thing that I can't get past is what you had mentioned even just last week that, um, I'm going to screw the scripture up, but uh, you'll choose either blessing or cursing. Yeah. But you choose. Yeah. The idea Deuteronomy of what... Deuteronomy 30. Yeah, and, and the idea of what Josh has the reliance on me for is not to make the choice for him, but for me to help enable him to make the choice. That's exactly right. To teach him to be wise. And you two have a responsibility because you want to do the things that make him privileged. Right. See, they make privilege a bad thing. It can be bad. But it can also be wonderful because we all, as we do things, we make it so our kids and our friends are, get, a, get a, a step ahead. Uh, the ability to process an idea or the ability to produce something or the ability to keep a job and show up on time or the ability to think in terms of compassion or, or a better product for the same value or whatever. When I was a little boy, my dad would, when we'd be driving down the road with him, he would say, okay, we're gonna, we're, we've got to drive for four hours. We're going to invite, we're going to invent four products. Nice. And so he would say, okay, so just be looking around. Now, this was back when he driving in a 98 Oldsmobile. It was all steel with no, with no safety equipment in it. If it went bad, we'd all die. <laughs> okay, so, and typically I'd be laying in the back window. Okay. All right, so he'd say, we're going to invent four products. And so, so do you know some of the things that we invented in that process? And he ended up invented? Seatbelts. No. <laughs> we never had a wreck. Have you ever driven through the Midwest and seen these blue harvest stores? They store great. The big, big blue silos that are harvest stores. A.O. Smith Harvest Store. My dad invented those. Have any of you ever used a cassette tape? Hitachi couldn't perfect that. My dad invented the little spring system and cassette tapes, they're gone now, but it made cassette tapes work. Have you ever bought a, 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 a wet dog food in the grocery store? My, every, all the dog food was dry before, our, before dad invented Rostin, for Rostin Purina Corporation, uh, a wet dog food. And it was at our house where he was testing that wet dog food and our cats ate it. And so the first slogan for it was, it's the dog food cats fight for. <laughs> okay. All right. It, so have any of you ever been to a dairy and you see the transparent uh, hoses coming off the udder of a cow so they can monitor the volume of milk going along there? Up until dad, those were all stainless steel and black hoses. He's the one that modified plastics so a, a dairy farmer could tell how he was producing. Okay, on and on and on it goes. That type of innovation makes America great. And we can't thwart it. And it's godly people or people that godly people have prayed for that help that process happen. Everybody, don't despise this. And when you meet a, a professional that's discouraged, tip, very often they're discouraged because of excessive control from outside forces so they can't do what they want to do to help people. And so, so I am really, really convinced that we don't have a perfect system but we've got the best system in the history of humanity. And that we need to keep the good parts of it, we need to continue to modify the questionable parts of it, but we need to, we need to be on top of this thing. And so, I don't know, this may ruin my life, but I mean, what more can I do? <laughs> I mean, 
where do we go from here? All right, I do have to read the scripture out of my Baptist heritage. Okay, I want you to see Ruth, the first chapter. Let's do this. In the days, in the days when, this is Ruth 1. When the days when judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land of Israel. So a man from Bethlehem, think of this, he's living in Bethlehem, in Judah, left his home and went to live in, a, in the country of Moab. Now Moab, for those of you that have been to Israel with us, by the way, did you guys get the information about the, the cruise? Oh, he can't do it. Oh, for security reasons. Same thing with Sam. Sam has to get permission from the defense department. And I told, I told Sam, I do not want a bunch of Palestinians with machine guns getting on our cruise ship looking for you. <laughs> and I said, if they do, I'm telling them where you are. It's over. <laughs> All right, so enough of that. All right. I probably shouldn't have said that, huh? Probably not. Okay. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah left the home. Oh, what I was going to say is they go to Moab. So from Bethlehem, for those of you that were there with us, you have to go over the mountain toward the east. It's toward Jericho. That's all rocky desert land there by Jericho. Then you go down to the Jordan River. You cross the Jordan River, and then you're in Moab. Okay, in Moab... That was where they wandered around so for those 40 years. All right, so they were leaving the, he was leaving the promised land because it was threatening for him to be in Israel because there was a drought. There is no record of that drought killing anybody. Okay, there was a drought, which meant it was inconvenient. Did, uh, um, the first chapter of Ruth is about them going someplace for convenience instead of going someplace because it was right. I think the core of this chapter, redemption comes in chapter 3 and 4. The core of this chapter is they go to Moab because of the drought. In your Christian life, even when you're in the land of blessing, there are going to be times of drought. There are going to be times when you might not hear the voice of God clearly. But all of us need to decide, do we do what culture says? Do we do what we want to do? What would be convenient? Or do we do the right thing? So I don't believe commencement addresses should be saying, follow your heart. I think they should be saying, serve people all the rest of your life. You have a great education here. Use it to serve people and make the world a better place. And make a profit at it. Make money for your family so you can be better off. Because when you're making money for your family, that's not taking money from other people. That's making money available for other people as well. Because our system creates wealth. We don't take wealth. All right? So, so, so they need to say that. I think there's one other lie, though, that I just hate it when I hear it. I understand it because Gail and I feel this way. We just don't say it a lot. When parents say to their kids, well, honey, we just want you to be happy. I really don't care if they're happy. Gail does more than I do. Okay, I want them to be good men. I want them to be better men than I am. And I want my daughter to be a good woman. And I want them to have be quality people that don't just do what makes them happy in the moment. I don't want them floating around. I don't want them having shallow commitments. I don't want them not paying their bills because they don't want to. I don't want that in them. I want them to know how to be strong. And sometimes when you're strong, you don't get to leave the desert and go to where there's watermelon. Okay, so here, here, they go to Moab. No, number, verse 2. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons were Malan and uh, Kilanon. They were Ephrodites. I know all these words, and my brain is going nuts. From Bethlehem in the land of Judah. And when they reached Moab, they settled there, and they stayed there. Okay, 
Then Elimelech died. The husband died. And Naomi was left with her two sons. Okay? Then the two sons married Moabite women. That too was forbidden in the scriptures. The scriptures told the Israelite women to marry Israelite men. And Israelite men to marry Israelite women. They left Israel, the land of milk and honey, because there was a drought. They went to a place where there were watermelons and apples. While they were there, dad died, and the two sons married Moabite women. It's predictable, totally predictable. Okay, so they married these two women. Let's see. Um, the two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Ophrah, and the other married Ruth. But about 10 years later, both Malan and Kilanon died. Okay, follow this, everybody. They left because of the drought. They went to Moab. Dad dies. They take some time. Both boys marry Mo Moabite women. Then both boys die. You got three widows there in Moab. Okay, so this is the setup for how life works for all of us. Have any of you ever made a mistake? <laughs> That's why Ruth is about redemption. This story is about redemption. But see, most people emphasize the redemption so strong, they never talk about the problem. This is the problem, convenience. This is the problem. It's, I want to marry her. Jonathan does it. Even though he's got his handicaps, we take him to the mall, and he'll see a pretty girl, and he'll say, I want her. And of course, it's embarrassing when he says it to somebody. I want you. But, but he says, I want one of those. Or I want that. And see, that, that's what happens. But he's got two good parents there that say, no, she's evil. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, so there they were alone. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed the people of Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to the homeland. They were going back to Bethlehem with her two daughters-in-law that she sent out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. So they're, they're coming back east now. They're heading toward the Jordan River, going to cross it, go through that desert land, and get up there to Bethlehem. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them bye-bye, and they all broke down and wept. So they loved each other. They were connected. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I, give you, can I still give birth to other sons who would grow up and be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if I, it were possible, and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry somebody else? Well, of course not. My, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you. Now, why were things bitter for her? Because her husband and her sons were dead. She's heading back with two foreign women. They were connected. They loved each other. All that's good. They're headed back to her family. And her heart is broken. Because she's alone. And even though she may want the compatibility of these two uh, daughter-in-laws with her, she encourages them to go back to their family. Things are far more bitter for me. Verse 14. And again they wept together. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung, 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 clung tightly to Naomi. How would I do it? Got it? Look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied. Now this is the famous verse. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. 
Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Then Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, and she said nothing more. All right, now, everybody. I've explained to you how people have different styles of attachment. Okay? I've explained to you that there are people that have a secure attachment style. Those are people that enjoy connecting with people. They draw strength from their relationships, draw security from their relationships. They draw health from their relationships. A secure attachment style means they're not insecure about rejection or acceptance. They can flow in a wholesome way with acceptance. They can flow in a wholesome way with rejection. Although nobody likes rejection, but, but they're able to handle it because they've got a secure attachment style. That's God's plan for all of us. But people that have gone through certain things have a more uh, anxious attachment style. These people are constantly be, being need, they constantly need to be convinced that they're loved. So they're a little too clingy with their spouse. They're a little too clingy with the kids because they need constant reassurance that other people love them. If something goes wrong, very often they're confrontation adverse because if something goes wrong, they're scared to death. I can tell you, the megachurch movement and the uh, many megachurch pastors that I know have an anxious attachment style. So they're constantly doing things to get people to tell them how loved they are. Okay, so, so an attachment, uh, 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 an anxious attachment style is, is a person that really, now, now all of us need acceptance, all of us need to know we're okay, but if we need to listen to Joel Osteen every single week and every single day to be convinced God really loves us, that may be anxiety. Okay, because God loves you, that's a fact, but you can be secure in it. He's not going to change. You don't have to be convinced of it every single day unless you have an, uh, an anxious attachment style. Okay, if you do have an anxious attachment style, you can confront that in yourself and get healed. You renew your mind and you realize, I think I'm being off-putting because I'm a little too clingy. Or I think this or that. Actually, David and Valerie, their elders here, they're going through a series of training right now on relationships and acceptance and getting some of these emotional things healed. And I think from what Gail told me, I haven't talked, should I say this? Okay, okay, so welcome to a believer's meeting. Huh? It's kind of out, yeah, what am I gonna say? That, the cautious one says, what are you gonna say? Mom says, sure, it's already into it. Okay, so... So, because, because they're very interested in people being healed from these types of things, because I know wonderful spirit-filled Christians that have learned that they need to connect in a healthy way, but they're anxious about it. So, if somebody's, oh, if, if somebody's not quite, somebody didn't say hello to them Sunday morning, it's typically me. Okay, so their anxious attachment style say, pastor didn't like me anymore. You see what I mean? Where I guarantee you, I don't say hello to a lot of people, but I still deeply love you. Well, most of the time. <laughs> okay, so, 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 so people have this. Then they also, if they have different things happen to it, to them, their attachment style might be avoidant, where they really are are connectivity averse. They, for their own security and defense, they are they essentially communicate. No matter what you do, I'm okay. Because that's a defensive, protective position. Okay, now, the wonderful Christians that I know that are avoidant suffer horribly. Because they try to connect. They try to do the things other people do that connect. But they don't because of things going on inside of them. So they struggle and they end up being rejected to, uh, often. And then they're independent and lonely in a crowd. Okay, God designed our families and churches to fix those issues. It doesn't fix, though, if they divorce their family and if they, if they are unable to stay consistent in a body of believers. See, because Ruth models here a... Um, 
a, a secure attachment style. Okay, think of it. Naomi is saying, we love each other, go home. An anxious attachment style would say, I wonder what I said. Or an anxious attachment style would say, oh, she loved me when I had her son as a husband. Now she's sending me home. An avoidant attachment style probably wouldn't be in this scene anyway. But notice this quote that we admire all over the world in Christian circles. When Ruth has the security to open her heart and connect, she's, she's already connected, obviously, but to open her heart and express verbally a connection where she's, she is leaving the Moabite gods that she was raised with. Those are spirits. She is leaving the culture she's comfortable with. And she is saying, this is incredible. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Here's what that reminds me of. One time I was standing on the front entrance to New Life. We were at our peak. We had 14,000 members, 1,100 small groups. And there was a woman that was particularly objectionable, causing trouble. I was standing in the front under one of the canopies. And the woman came up and was continuing to be particularly objectionable to me. And I said, I think I want to resign as your pastor today. And I know there are 350 churches in town that have much more capable pastors than I. So I encourage you to find that pastor. You know what she did? She turned to me and she said, not in your lifetime. <laughs> she said, I'm a member of this church and I am submitted to you in your flock. I pray for you every day. I know your kids' names, and this is my church. Now, I know I have social problems, but it's your job to help me fix them. <laughs> she turned into the most wonderful woman. In that moment, I fell in love with her. All right? Because that's a dream. It's every parent's dream for your son or your daughter to say, you are my father and I admire and love you, or you are my mother, and I will, I will take care of you all your life. Okay, do you hear how this works? A secure attachment style is what Ruth is communicating here. She says, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I'm going. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. By the way, here's one way I judge pastors. If I'm doing a pastor's conference or something, I ask how many of them have burial plots in the city where they're ministering. Because if they're just hirelings and passing through, I don't want to hear from them. If they got the job in that city in a bigger church than their last one because the salary was better, okay. I want to know the guys that are called to the city. I want to know the guys that are going to help people raise their kids and stick with them when their kids go through their stages. See, this thing about I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. This is authentic friendship. When I was writing the blog on attachment is the key to love. Love being living for the good of the other. It may or may not have a lot of emotions attached to it. Raising my children, sometimes I was just overcome in love and adoration for my children. Other times I just wanted to get them a broom and help them clean, or they needed to help me clean out the garage. Different emotions. Okay? As I was writing that blog, I thought, you know, Sam Berenger is one guy that probably understands this more than any other because of his work with the special forces. I'm trying to, I, I don't want to violate anything since we're recording this. Um, we may have to clean that up. We may have to, I, I'll just say the, oh no, I should, how should I do it? Sam, okay, so <clears throat> because 
what, what he does is he, he, under his command are medics that work with the special forces team. They go, they are special forces people that they train as medics so that when they're in a firefight or when they're in a life-threatening situation, they don't have to call medic. The medic's already with them. He's part of the team. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what, that's what he does professionally. That's also why we have so many wounded warriors. Lots of the guys and gals that used to die on the field, he saves their lives. And so we've got them, and we thank God for that work. Okay, so I called him, and I said, hey, Sam, I'm working on this blog on attachment being the key to love. How does that work? Because I said, your guys come home from battle, and they're more attached to their buddies than they are to their families sometimes. How does that happen? And he said, oh, we're clear about it. You aren't a friend unless you're willing to die to save the other guy's life. He said, that friendship term, he said, we've got that down. It's the exact same friendship that Jesus has toward us. Jesus demonstrated his friendship by being willing to live his life for us. And he continues to do it. This is Sam Berenger. I mean, this guy's a warrior. This guy understands evil and good. He understands how to make a young, young boy a man and how to make a, a, a woman that's struggling with all kinds of issues a, a woman of substance. I mean, this guy, I love him. And he, you know what he says to me? He said to me, this is ages ago. He said, Ted Haggard, I don't care what you do, what trouble you get in, what foolishness is in your life, I am your friend for life. Do you think that, that caused insecurity and anger and fear in me? Made me want to burn out as a pastor? Fear. It did fear, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because he could determine the end of my life. <laughs> I had one guy come up one time and say, Sam Berenger just pushed me against the wall, and I want you to deal with it. He, oh, yeah, he said, Sam Berenger said if I did that again, he'd kill me. He said, so what are you going to do about it? That's what he said. And I said, don't do that again. <laughs> All right, so everybody, the subject here is friendship, and I'm not distracted. Okay. 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 See, that's th this thing that Ruth is communicating is what opens the door for the miracle of redemption in the upcoming chapters. These people made a mess of things. They went to the wrong place. People were dying because of it. There was all kinds of things doing. But Ruth connected to Naomi. That friendship established a strength that opened the door for beautiful miracles. And it's the redemption story we always preach on. We never talk about this, but this is the reality in every one of our lives in this room. And every one of us, if we expect to be lone ranger or lone, just independent people and recover from the things that have wounded us the worst, we, do, we aren't understanding the body of Christ and the family of God. But this type of friendship commitment that's not contingent, where we say, I'm going to protect you no matter what. Right, I, I'm going to use you as an example, because now you're a family friend since we've talked to your mom. Right back there sits the lady who drove into the back of my car when I was driving down Woodman Boulevard. Huh? Yeah, she's waving her hand saying, hi, everybody. <laughs> okay, she drove into the back of my car. If I mistell this, correct me. She came out. She was upset about her driving in the back of my car. And I saw that she was upset, and the first thing, I, I think it was the first thing I said to her was, I am a pastor. I will not do anything that will hurt you. I mean, I drive a 2004 Subaru. Who cares? <laughs> okay, so said that, and we both decided that it was best uh, not to call the police, you get a police report, and she says, I'll pay you for all the damage. Get an assessment, I'll pay you for it, okay? So we went our own ways. 
I never expected to hear from her or see her again. Okay. Then a couple days later, I got the, uh, uh, pray, uh, the uh, estimate. She comes walking in a couple days later with a cashier's check. She said, I have half of it. I'll pay you for the other half as soon as I have it. I said, you don't know the other half. Forget it. It's done. I'll take care of it. This is not a big deal. Uh, you're, you are a young woman with a young husband. You're starting life together. You're both working. Forget it. You do not need the burden of this thing. I expected never to see her again. I'm upstairs in my office. She comes walking in with a big box of gifts and the cash for the other half. Not a check. Cash. I never see cash. <laughs> okay. So I can't believe it. She has this big gift. She has all these gifts. She has the check. And here's what I told her. I said, you can't be this good on your own. You must have awesome parents. And I said, I know you've made good decisions, but you had to have good parents too. And we had a discussion about that. And we hugged one another, which according to modern terms, sh shouldn't be appropriate, but it was. Because I thought, this young woman is amazing. Then the next Three weeks later, her husband comes walking in the church. He comes in discreetly, comes back, sits right back there. I go up to the husband and he tells me who he is. I say, I love your wife. Okay, I'm 63, I can do that now. Okay, and so there are some benefits to age. And so we talk about it and that's a wonderful conversation. Then the next week, both of them are here. Then I come into my office about two weeks later, and there are four messages from a woman on my phone saying, I need help taking care of my mother. Does anybody in your church have the ability to help me with my mother so that I can work? But she didn't leave one message. She left four messages, four messages. Well, as that was going on, Gail was getting her CNA, Certified Nurse's Assistant Documentation and Education. So she got that. So I, I call the woman back, and she says, it's her mother. And then she says, I think you know my daughter. That's her daughter. She says, I need to get back to work, but my mother's at home, and she needs some care from time to time. I said, this is so strange, because number one, I already love your family. Number two, this may be the Holy Spirit. Gail just got her CNA, which a CNA is the certification to be able to help people with people. All right, Gail just got this. So Gail calls her mother back, and they become great friends over the phone. Okay, now I don't know that Gail's ever going to help with the mom, but Gail will work with mom and grandma and, and put all that together. Now, everybody... Here's what that is. That's the hand of the Lord working with people that have secure attachment styles. It's what happens when people are committed to each other being better off. Nobody's going to abuse anybody. Nobody's going to take advantage of anybody. Nobody's going to do that type of thing. And I'm not saying you be weak. You got to be substantive. But I am saying... What G the way Jesus designed, designed us to connect is maybe the most important thing we do. Because that connection opens the door for worship. It opens the door for prayer. It opens the door for love. It opens the door for admiration. It opens the door for compliments. It opens the door for respect. It opens the door all the way through. This Ruth paragraph is awesome. It's time to go. Father, we love you. We praise you. We adore you. And we celebrate your word in our lives. And we make a commitment to open our hearts and be everything you want us to be in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. amen. God bless you all. Go rejoicing.